My dear faithful, some words in this, the feast day of the Assumption of the Blessed Mother into heaven. The belief obviously comes down from the time of the apostles, even though uh, sometimes in the early centuries we don't have the written account. But Pius XII, putting all this into consideration, in 1946 he asked all the bishops, the residential bishops in the world, to a couple of questions. Whether they believe, the bishops, whether they believe that the assumption could be defined as a dogma of our faith, and two, whether they, and the flock committed to their care, desired the proposed definition. Now, the papal letter was answered by 1,232 residential bishops. That is 98% of the total. And of these, 1,210, 98.2%, answered in the affirmative yes to those things. 16 bishops hesitated concerning the opportuneness of the definition like some had done uh, before Vatican, the, the first Vatican Council we had uh, in 1870. They were questioning it's not the time of infall uh, to declare infallibility, kind of somewhat like that, but it's not that they didn't believe, it, believe in it, but they didn't think it was opportune. And only six doubted that the assumption could be defined. Now, such amazing unanim unanimity has seldom been recorded in the annals of the church that so many... Uh, uh, what do you call it, more than uh, a majority, you can say uh, practically universally, all the bishops in the flock with them said, no, this, can, this is the time to do this, for we believe this. Now, the whole, now, since the vast majority of bishops in union with the Holy See cannot possibly err in doctrinal matters, the Holy Father rightly inferred that the assumption was a revealed truth. Judging from the general tenor of the papal document, one gathers that this is considered by the Pope the most cogent argument in justification of the dogmatic definition, to having all this unanimity uh, believing the same thing. Now, we considering the gospel, I should say, the biblical account, the one that gets pointed to the most, if you had to pick one, is actually at the very beginning. And think of this, our Lord created... Uh, the earth and uh, all the creatures on it and then man at the end and then he rested and time went by Adam and Eve came onto earth uh, and we know Adam sinned original sin and we know though immediately when when God called out to them and they conversed and what do you call it uh, what do you call it they with that original sin on them now they had to work and and, and what do you call it, have toil and uh, be tempted to, and be able to fall into temptation, to, to fall into temptation because they already had the big test and they failed. But uh, the Almighty God gave them that great hope of a Redeemer in Genesis 3.15. And in that, as we know, it also talks about the, what do you call it, the Blessed Mother, uh, that she will crush the heel of Satan. So with the Redeemer, our Lord, who was mentioned first, the Redeemer shall come. But right after that, word is implied and understood by the history and what the fathers teach us that that lady is our, is, is, is the blessed mother, that she would crush the head of Satan. So she has this great, um, role working with our Redeemer. Now, her Redeemer is the Son of God, the Redeemer is the Son of God, and she is her mother, his mother, and she had such a close connection throughout his life, and it would only seem right that in the end, she would have this special um, privilege. And I'm just going to go how, and tell you how the assumption is connected with other truths concerning the Blessed Mother. Now, uh, mother's, uh, Blessed Mother's assumption is not only in absolute, in absolute harmony with other dogmas and accepted Catholic doctrines, it would seem to be even demanded by some of them, you can say. Now, in the bull of the definition, Pius XII frequently stresses this phase of the dogma. Now, particular importance in this connection are the divine motherhood, the Blessed Mother's divine motherhood, because she is the mother of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. She is the mother of his human nature. Therefore, she is, since Christ is God, the mother of God, that understanding and, and that, look at the proper text. 
She also, he brings up the Immaculate Conception and the Co-Redemption. Now the following is but an outline of the argumentation. Concerning the divine motherhood, Christ being an accomplished exemplar of perfect obedience to the law of God, he could never transgress it since he is the author, he must have loved and honored his mother in an exceedingly perfect manner in accordance with the fourth commandment. So if you are a faithful Catholic and you have parents, or even if they've gone before us, uh, you honor them and you love them as well as you can. I'm sure you would want to do everything you could for them, everything that was possible. And of course, that was the mindset of our Lord. Therefore, it is reasonable to be, pre pre be presumed that he wished to honor her by preserving her from the corruption of the grave and by granting to her an anticipated bodily glorification in heaven. Now, this argument, you know, it, what do you call, is one of the most fitting and even if it is not the definitive proof. Now, with the Immaculate Conception, the argument has been authoritatively enunciated by Pius XII in the following words. These two privileges, that is, the Assumption and the Immaculate Conception of our Blessed Mother, are most closely bound to one, to one another. Indeed, Christ overcame sin and death by his own death. And the man who through baptism is supernaturally regenerated has conquered sin and death through the same Christ. However, as a general rule, God does not wish to grant to the just the full effect of their victory over death until the end of time shall have come. And so it is that the body of men, bodies of even the just, are corrupted after death. Certain saints are accepted, but as a rule, this is what happens, and that the only on the last day will they be joined, each to his own glorified soul. Nevertheless, God has willed that the Blessed Virgin Mary should be exempted from this general law. Now, by an entirely unique privilege, she completely overcame sin through her immaculate conception, and therefore was not subject to that law of remaining in the corruption of the grave. Nor did she have to wait until the end of time for the redemption of her body. Now going on to the co-redemption. As co-redemptrix, our Blessed Lady was indissolubly associated with the Redeemer in his redemptive role and mission. Now we know from Revelation that in the case of Christ, the work of redemption necessarily implied the utter destruction of Satan's dominion one aspect of which is the state of permanent death until the end of time. Hence, we can scarcely assume that our Blessed Lady was subject to this penalty, for in this event she would be a victim of, rather than a victor over, the infernal foe. And he have never had any authority over her, or any, any pull, or anything like that. Now Mary's complete triumph, then, closely followed the pattern of our Lord's triumph. Like her own son, she defeated death, not by dying, but by not remaining dead. Now, now going on, we could think of the cult of Our Lady, that following and veneration that we all, as faithful Catholics, should have towards our Blessed Mother. Now, in view of the sublime prerogatives which Almighty God has so liberally bestowed on our Blessed Lady, it is obvious that she is entitled to receive a distinct cult from all her children, this cult, this following, veneration, which consists essentially in a grateful recognition of her unique dignity and exalted privilege, is, techn is technically called hyperdulia, hyperdulia, and differs fundamentally from that of latria, which is worship given to God and God alone. We worship Almighty God. And is different from that of dulia, which is veneration due to the saints, the ordinary ve veneration to the saints of God. And just uh, something you might, some very old books you might see, uh, maybe from the 1800s or, or before that, even you might have old prayers from them, and it sometimes mentions worship of the saints or things like that. And we, with uh, the way words evolve and what have you, what several hundred years ago would have been understood by people of the faith, when we're saying, oh, we, we worship the saints, what have you, that meant then, as it does now, as, as we believe now, veneration great consideration, prayers, special devotion because of how they closely followed God. It is not the way we think of worship as we offer worship to Almighty God at Mass because God alone, the way we understand worship, 
can have that. For he, as the first commandment clearly tells us that, just so you always re recall that. Uh, but the Blessed Mother.